distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, and members of the Canberra community, a very warm welcome, and it is rather warm. Um, this is our first burst of spring, isn't it wonderful? Welcome to Conversations number eight. I'm Jacqueline Lowe, the Director of the Centre for European Studies. The Centre is an initiative of the ANU and the European Union. And this year is a very special year for us because uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of formal relations between the EU and Australia. And as part of um, a, a series of activities that this centre and our partner centres in Australia, within Australia and New Zealand have been conducting, we've been running these conversations on a monthly basis where groups of ambassadors, European ambassadors, uh, meet with a significant Australian uh, diplomats and officials, and they are interviewed by a senior journalist from the Australian media to talk about matters European and Australian. Um, so tonight we're very, very pleased to welcome back to the podium, to the hot seat, Mr. Paul Barclay from ABC Radio National. Um, before I proceed any further, let me on our collective behalf acknowledge that we're meeting here on Ngunnawal land, and so I pay um, our collective respects to the traditional custodians of the land and to acknowledge their culture, which is among the longest surviving cultures in human history. Um, the conversations um, program and project, this, uh, this year-long project, has been um, very, very successful, certainly beyond um, our initial planning. It is now a multimedia extravaganza, so uh, this event is being filmed by Sky News APEC and broadcast um, through Australia and into the Asian region, um, so the ambassadors will get uh, multiple airtime. It is also being recorded for broadcast and podcast on ABC Radio National's Big Ideas program, and you're welcome to visit that after... Um, your visit here tonight, and we're also making a film out of it. The musical will come later. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to take up any more of your time other than to say that, you know, how pleased we are that you're here, and do please stay uh, for a reception later this evening following the, the, the conversations. There will be opportunity um, to take questions from the floor uh, fielded by um, Paul mm. um, towards the um, latter part of um, the recording as well. So a very warm welcome to you and enjoy your evening. Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming along to the latest in our series of EU discussions. I'm Paul Barclay, as you heard from Big Ideas on ABC Radio National. Thanks once again to the ANU Centre for European Studies for hosting tonight's event. It's been terrific to come along here this year and uh, it's been a really stimulating series of conversations so far, and let me repeat what Jacqueline just said, <laughs> drinks after the event have been provided by the ambassadors tonight, so stick around and mingle and have a, a chat about some of the issues that we raised tonight. That would be great if you could. Uh, just a reminder, this year we've been commemorating a 50-year milestone since the commencement of relations between the European Union and Australia, and uh, big ideas in conjunction with the delegation of the European Union to Australia has, I suppose, used this anniversary as a pretext to discuss some of the significant issues facing the EU today. It's been a great pleasure and privilege to speak to a number of ambassadors from EU member states. Um, tonight we're turning our attention to questions such as, what is Europe? How is it determined which countries have the right to become members of the EU and how do they qualify uh, for such? For example, there's a debate about the application of Turkey to accede to the EU. Is Turkey really a European country? How do we best integrate new member states into the EU and how do we integrate immigrants, bearing in mind that Europe has um, an immigration rate and illegal immigration problem, if I can use that term, that certainly dwarfs ours here in Australia, uh, despite the fact that we seem rather obsessed with our relatively small illegal immigration problem. Uh, we'll also tonight to go back to one of the darkest times in recent European history, the Balkan Wars, which shook Europe and the EU to the core. 
Uh, as Jacqueline said, tonight's conversation with Europe will be on air on Big Ideas tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. and it will be available for download and podcast beforehand. Uh, if you get onto the Big Ideas website, which is abc.net.au slash Radio National, there'll be a menu of programs. If you go onto the Big Ideas website, all of our programs, including tomorrow's, are usually up mid-afternoon, so you don't even have to wait actually to the broadcast. You can just put it on your phone or your iPod beforehand. Okay, let me introduce tonight's guests to you. At the end, we have Ruth Pierce. Ruth is these days the Head of Public Diplomacy and Information in the Public Diplomacy and Information Branch at DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but uh, Ruth is a former ambassador. She's been in Poland, she's been in Russia, so we'll be drawing on that expertise as well. Sitting next to Ruth, we have His Excellency, Mr. Vicenje Biuk. I hope I've got that right. Uh, that's as good as I can do. <laughs> the Ambassador of Croatia. Uh, thank you. Uh, on my immediate left, just here, is um, uh, Anna Maria Shiko, the Ambassador of Hungary. And in the middle, we have His Excellency, uh, Mr. David Daly, the Ambassador of the EU. Would you please make them welcome tonight? So yes, David, the uh, enlargement of the EU does rather raise this question, what is Europe? Um, I just mentioned Turkey in the introduction. Uh, what, what countries can and what countries should belong in the European Union? Well, the countries that can belong, I mean, membership of the European Union is open to any European country that is basically committed to democratic values, respect of human rights, the rule of law, and, and, and so on. I mean, that's in a very shorthand um, the, 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 the essence of the, the eligibility to apply. Um, when countries apply, and the idea, the question as to who should join, uh, this is a more complicated uh, mm -hmm. question because it depends on an appreciation of exactly the, the degree to which uh, the country that applies actually is meeting uh, certain criteria. Now, um, we have worked uh, over the years, you can imagine, we've gotten a lot of experience in the enlargement business. And this experience has... Um, enabled us to, to map out uh, four main criteria uh, that we use in the process. Can I, can I, I'll come to that criteria yeah. in just a moment. But okay. uh, Turkey, for example, has, according to my geography, one city that is in geographical Europe, uh, that being Istanbul, yet it wants to be a member of the EU. I mean, is it a European country? Is it an Asian country? Do these questions preoccupy determinations about which countries can become members of the EU? Um, well, they, they can do, but in the case of Turkey, um, the question is already answered insofar as um, all of the member states um, agreed that uh, Turkey, from this point of view, is eligible. Um, on the 3rd of October uh, 2005, we opened negotiations uh, with Turkey. So, or accepted to open the negotiations. So, for quite a while now, um, we have been in negotiation with Turkey. Um, so that part of the question is, is answered. Now, I wouldn't for a moment suggest that the Turkish case is in any way simple. Um, it, is a, I, I, it is a very complicated case. Um, all enlargements are, are complicated enough. Mm. Um, but the Turkish uh, case is one where I would say that Turkish uh, membership of the European Union is a, is, a, is a big strategic prize for Europe, but it is a very long game. Mm. And I would also say that uh, the, the Turkey of today will not join the European Union. Mm. Um, because if you take a photograph of a Turkey on the eve of its eventual membership of the European Union, and you compare it with a, a photograph of Turkey today, those photographs will still be very different because there's an awful lot that Turkey still needs to do. Such as? 
there's a lot more to be done in the area of improvement of human rights, freedom of expression, um, judicial arrangements, some constitutional arrangements. Um, these, this is a work in progress mm. with, uh, with Turkey. I mean, earlier this year, Turkey presented a, a third judicial reform package, um, which brought Turkey again a number of steps forward. Mm. Um, there were other elements which were not, uh, which, which are still incomplete. So there will be a fourth judicial package, and this is part of the iterative process that you that you get into. Mm, yes. The EU, I think it's fair to say, used to essentially be a Western European Union. It's now expanding eastwards. How many countries can the EU handle, do you think? Is, is, its, is its enlargement as, as infinite as the imagination of Europe itself? Well, there is a limit even to imagination in the sense that, well, the, there's no limit to imagination, but there is a limit to where the imagination can bring you. a geographic limit, yeah, yes. Yeah, because it's, it's still, uh, it's, it's open to European countries. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that is one uh, limit. Um, the, the real question here, I think, is what can we handle as the European Union? Mm. Um, because uh, there is an issue that um, the union, the enlargement process also has to take into account the ability of the European Union to function and to be able to continue the process of deeper integration in Europe. Now, this in fact is the, the, the fourth uh, criterion that right. I mentioned earlier that there were four. But this is a criterion, if you like, on our side of the table. Yeah. And uh, this criterion has led Europe to uh, substantially revise the internal rule book as to how we do our business. Um, we had uh, a series of different treaties in the 90s and, and, and early years of, of, of this century, culminating in the Lisbon Treaty, which amended our internal rule book. Mm. We brought more issues out of the area of where we need unanimity and into the area where we can have what we call a qualified majority vote, precisely so that we wouldn't get blocked uh, by, um, by uh, in a larger union uh, having, having always the need for unanimity. Mm. But this revision of our internal rule book we were revising a rule book that had been basically unchanged since the union was founded with mm. six original members. Mm. So this question as to how much we can handle, it's a very real one. We have found an answer uh, for now, and I think that this answer is, 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 will see us for, for, for the next uh, number of years uh, easily. And the last thing I would say is that there, there was a concern on the part of many that... Um, with a, a large uh, accession of 10 countries on the same day mm. in 2004 and then followed later by Romania Bulgaria, um, would we not come into some sort of gridlock? Yeah. And the answer is no. Europe has continued to function. Europe has continued to deepen what it does, notwithstanding the fact that we have moved overnight from 15 member states to 25, and from 25 to 27, mm. and next July to 28, when mm. Croatia joins. So the amendment of the rule book has been very important in, in ensuring that we don't, and we have not had gridlock. We are talking about enlargement tonight, uh, largely because we have the Croatian ambassador with us tonight, Vincenzo. Uh, Croatia is about to become the newest member of the EU. This is already agreed. Croatia will enter the EU in July 2013. How big a deal is this for Croatia? I think it's, it's, it's a really big deal for Croatia, as you said. Um, if we're talking about European Union and enlargement, and if you go back, for example, in the last century, that we can say that the last century in Europe was a century of wars. Mm. First World War, the second, then uh, many local wars. Unfortunately, one of one that wars happened uh, in, in Croatia. Mm. And uh, now, when 27 countries 
and next year 28 with, with Croatia, are under the same roof. There is no more uh, 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 possibility of, of new war. I think that's the, 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 the best thing that uh, uh, European Union brings to, to Europe. And uh, of course, uh, after falling communism in Eastern Europe, mm. it was a big chance for all those countries to join the demo de democratic uh, uh, Western European uh, uh, nations. Mm. And that happens. And uh, I think uh, uh, Croatia, as a new member of, of EU, has a, a good chance to uh, improve their political, economical, uh, legal system and, and many other things. Mm. So wh where does Croatia stand now? You know that you'll be uh, a member this time next year. Is there a sort of in-between status when you uh, sort of know that you're about to become a member but you haven't been formally admitted mm. yet? What, what, I, what? I think uh, uh, now we are in, in process of confirmation uh, session treaty in uh, EU member state parliaments. And uh, it finished in uh, 14 parliaments of 27. Mm. And uh, for sure, uh, uh, we expect that uh, on 1st July next year, we'll be a, a full member of EU. Mm. This will be something celebrated by your nation I, and, yeah, yeah, and by the course. citizens Look, of your nation? As, as, I, as I mentioned, our, our history was, was very tough. We were engaged in, in both world wars, and uh, in the last decade or last century, we have had a war in our homeland, and uh, we put all our efforts in, 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 in the fight for freedom and independence. After war finished, we have to re rebuild our country and, and people's life, and unfortunately, we, we lost uh, uh, nine or ten years. Mm to start negotiate with, uh, uh, with, with the EU, mm. like other countries which joined EU 2004. They started in 1992, yeah. when we were on the top of, of, of war. Mm. And we started, unfortunately, uh, at uh, 2001, mm. nine years after. Yeah. And, and I, I think that will be a, a good reason for, for celebration, for celebration, democracy and long-term peace, not just in Croatia, but in whole Europe. Uh, Ruth, David mentioned before that there was some question about how much enlargement the EU could handle. Uh, and He says he believes the, the EU has handled it. There's been no problem. The, the processes have not become more cumbersome and more complex as a result of the EU expanding. Do you, do you agree? Well, I guess from my Polish experience, I would have to agree fully. I think Poland's a wonderful uh, example of the uh, success and effectiveness of expansion. Um, it's the, it was the biggest new EU member. Mm -hmm. It's now one of the six biggest EU members. Um, it's very committed to more, not less members. Mm. Uh, the Eastern Partnership, which uh, it's been uh, pushing uh, very strongly. Um, so, and I think it's a, a great model for uh, the wonderful advantages of being a, a member of the EU. Mm. Anna, how do you see the Eastern enlargement of the EU? What, why do you think this push is so important? Well, we think it's a process mm. that all of us, we Europeans, should uh, come together. Mm. And as uh, I agree with you, Sanchez, that uh, we have fought long and hard enough in the last, not just the last hundred years, more than hundreds and hundreds of years on various issues. and. Uh, being European mm. now is codified mm. in the way, as uh, David explained, that this is a, a code of conduct. It's like a club mm. that you have, you have to accept the rules and then all the members have to also vote for you to be, to be part of it. So mm. it's a two-stage thing. We started our negotiation in 1992. I must say that at the time we thought it would go a bit faster, but then in 2004, with uh, 10 of us, nine other countries joined, and it has created a lot of opportunities for all these countries, Hungary mm. included. Uh, a bit, like, as I said, like being members of a club. People then know what to expect of you. They know uh, that you behave in mm. a re legal, transparent, recognised mm. way. Mm. 
And therefore, uh, it's, it's probably much easier to then acquaint yourself and, and uh, allow yourself to be acquainted with the world. And the union has changed as more Eastern European countries have joined, do you think? Well, as we see it, we have been in Europe for over a thousand years and we think this is now <laughs> Europe reunited. <laughs> so uh, we are members of the European Union since 2004. We have been in Europe for about 1,100 years and we expect to do the same for the next You are taking your rightful <laughs> place. Uh, Yes. <laughs> David, how much more aware is the EU about... Um, well, well, are there... I suppose, let, let me frame it this way. Are there risks in admitting countries uh, and have there been mistakes made in the past uh, in terms of letting countries in, perhaps with uh, economic criteria that weren't quite as, as strict? H have any lessons been learnt in the past about this? Well, admitting countries that weren't ready, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think there's a, a trap not to fall into, and, and that is, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, looking back and saying, oh, I'm not sure that that particular country, when it joined on such and such a year, was really fully ready. I mean, this is a, a sort of a counter-historical uh, approach which, which doesn't take anybody very far. Um, we have to remember that... Um, over the, there are a number of, of issues. The first is that there are criteria to join the European Union. Um, you have to be a democratic country with institutions that protect um, uh, human rights, democracy, the rule of law, and, and so on. Mm. You have to have a functioning market economy that is strong enough to be able to withstand the competitive pressures of being in the fiercely competitive marketplace of the European Union. Mm. And you have to have the ability to be able to implement European law. Mm. Now, um, these criteria, um, they have, one way or another, they've always been there. But over the years, we've gotten better at the enlargement business. Mm. Um, we, uh, the, the a key, the body of European law has hugely developed over the last 20 years. Um, that development means that if you make a, an historical comparison between you know, the, the, the joining of Hungary in, in, in 2004 or the joining of Croatia next year, and you try and compare it with when Ireland joined in 1973, well, at a certain level, the comparison is no longer valid because the body of law of the European Union has evolved so much uh. in the meantime. So the, this is just a, an indicator of the sort of trap to avoid in this sort of discussion. On the other hand, um, we have gotten, as I said, we've gotten better at, at the enlargement business. The pros when the Berlin Wall fell mm. and the world changed, uh. we saw immediate, well, we saw quickly that we needed to uh, prepare ourselves for the question that the newly freed countries from Central and Eastern Europe were going to put on the table, yeah. which is, can we join your democratic club? Yeah. And we were, we were forced to go back to the, to, 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 to not the drawing board, but take out a blank sheet of paper and write down what are the key issues for joining our club. Mm -hmm. And they were the issues that I mentioned, they're called the Copenhagen <coughs> criteria, they were developed uh, and agreed uh, in, in 1993. But from that point on, we undertook a very deep and systematic evaluation of what is the body of law of the European Union. Now, this work has never stopped. We have always been in the enlargement business ever since, and we have been refining what it is are the key elements of EU law that countries have to be able to uh, implement. Mm. And that's why when you talk to practitioners in the, in the art of enlargement, they'll immediately start talking about the difficulties of chapter 8 or <laughs> chapter 5 or this or that. We broke down the huge corpus of EU law into bite-sized chunks called chapters, which um, are the sectoral uh, elements of the law. Mm. So when you want to talk about competition and state aids, 
then this is a debate in the context of chapter 8. If you yeah. want to talk about public procurement, this is chapter 5 and so on. There are 35 of these chapters. Now, this process is much more sophisticated uh, today than ever before. It was, we, we had a huge, on our side, we had a huge learning uh, exercise as well through the accession process of Poland, Hungary and the other countries. Was it because symbolically important as well as a, as a gesture post the, 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 end of the, uh, the, the end of the era of the Iron Curtain? No, no, uh, maybe maybe the, the, uh, the other ambassadors who are part of yeah. Eastern Europe and, and, and yourself, Ruth, who has served as, as an ambassador in that part of the world, can answer this. I mean, is, an imp is it an important symbolic gesture? Gesture might be uh, or recognition, uh, uh, symbolic recognition. Uh, not the mm. word I would use. I'd say that this was uh, something that uh, post Second World War, all of our countries aspired to, which is freedoms. You know, the European Union is yeah. based on values. It's freedom, democratic freedom, speech, movement, people, mm. and capital. And that's all we wanted, is to be free, to have a fair go, as you say in Australia. Yeah. And we all just wanted a fair go. And I think we, uh, we proved that uh, we can accept and, and adopt all the ACI, which is the body of law, yeah. live according to them, and, uh, and therefore we are part of the same family. And as all families, we have squabbles, but we have the basic uh, uh, Sunday dinners that we all like best. We mm. you? Uh, ha the importance of uh, enlargement post the, the end of communism? Look, as I, as I said, um, that's a great chance for all those countries to improve their democratic system, legal system, their ec economies. And of course, I think uh, the, the biggest thing if uh, it's uh, uh, that those people can finally feel free, mm. because uh, and in, under the, in, in countries under the communist regime, uh, that feeling was, was terrible. Yeah. And if you think, why so many people in Australia today, living in Australia, are from those countries? From my country, from Hungary, from Poland, from Ukraine, from all those countries, because of that. Mm. In, in, in those countries, people didn't feel free and uh, uh, I think that that's something amazing for for all of us, and uh, I'm I'm very happy when I'm when I see, uh, for example, in, in in Croatia, very young Croats uh, born here in in Australia, and mm. that they came back to to Croatia and mm. they they finish they studying here and doing job in in Croatia, mm. not just for for Croatian companies but for multinational companies situated in, in, in Croatia, that's, that's a great thing. Yeah, and, and Ruth, you were saying that uh, in terms of the benefit that's flowed onto countries since joining the, the uh, EU, a country like Poland has been remarkably resilient during the global financial crisis when uh, other seemingly more robust and perhaps uh, higher profile European countries have not. Mm, yes, um, but like, I think, you know, EU empowerment was you know, very, very central to Poland's um, uh, situation and uh, its sort of pragmatism uh, and very empowerment. And I think the global financial crisis, the fact that uh, Poland was the only EU country not to go into the red, um, yes. it was very much empowered by, uh, I think, EU and... Uh, but geostrategically as well, Paul, for Poland, I think particularly um, it was seen as you know, well and truly moving into the bigger Europe. And that's, the as I said, the focus on the Eastern Partnership and not excluding the, you know, Ukraine, Belarus from engaging uh, on strict conditions. But mm. that's a very important part of Poland's uh, yeah. um, self-identity. We can't really... I'd, I'd like to also come in on sure. this. Um, firstly, I'd like to fully agree with Anna, oh. who immediately picked you up on, was this a symbolic gesture? This was not a gesture. The symbolism of the enlargement is huge, but it was not a gesture. Oh. I mean, the world changed in 89, and um, the European Union and the countries themselves 
rose to this incredibly difficult challenge of wedding themselves together in this democratic club. Mm. Now, that is not nothing. This is what, uh, what uh, Chris Patton, now, now Lord Patton, uh, Chris Patton has called regime change without using tanks. Mm. This is the power of the, uh, diplomat of the democratic club that is the European Union. Mm. We can't really talk about uh, Croatia and joining the, uh, the Union without referring to the, the recent terrible period that your country and the Balkans region went through in the 1990s. Um, the, the worst, perhaps, atrocity since the Second World War for, for your part of the world. H how tangible, Vincente, are the attentions in that region still today as a result of the, the Balkan Wars, would you say? How much has been pushed aside and how much repair work is still to be done? Look, who started <coughs> starting to formating the uh, European Union? Germany and France. The biggest enemy during the oh. World War II. Yeah. Previous I said that uh, today uh, Croatia and Hungary are probably the best uh, uh, neighbour countries in, 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 in that part of Europe, but uh, 100 uh, years before, uh, uh, Hungary was the, the biggest enemy for, for Croatia. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the same scenario now is happening on, in, in, in that part of Europe that we called Southeast Europe, not just Balkan, because Croatia is not really a Balkan country. Yugoslavia as a whole was a Balkan country, yeah. but Slovenia and, and, uh, and Croatia are more middle Europe and Mediterranean uh, 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 countries. Um, and what we are doing now, now we are, we are helping our neighbor countries on their way to, to the European Union. For example, we, uh, uh, due to the program of regional assistance, we are helping them, helping them and uh, we are providing them, uh, for example, translations of EU acquis. Uh -huh. And that, that, that's really true. We, we try to forget those terrible uh, 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 moments and go forward to EU. And I think uh, uh, one very important reason uh, for uh, uh, why we need uh, uh, European Union, all European countries, uh, uh, special small countries like Croatia is, in, in this very globalized world, when you have on one side uh, uh, <clears throat> United States and on another side China and tomorrow India, uh, if you compare any European countries, even Germany or France, they, they are very small compared with those giants. Mm -hmm. But when they are together, uh, and uh, that means about 500 people, uh, that means something, uh, something, something. So the different. forgiveness, the forgiveness is underway, um, even amongst those. I mean, you have high school students in your country who can remember the war. So it's still very fresh. Look, I, I, I think reconciliation is a, is a process, like democracy, like forming the EU. Then it, it will take time. But I, I think uh, um, the, the, the biggest responsibility is on our politicians, our uh, uh, ministers and, and the presidents, mm. to, to, to creating a, a, a better atmosphere between those countries. I, I, I can say... For, can say, for example, that uh, our relations, special with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, are, are, mm. are really, really good. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, also with the other countries, and uh, probably uh, uh, the biggest troublemaker at that time was Serbia. But now we are communicate, communicating uh, uh, pretty, pretty fluent, as I can mm. say. And we, we really uh, uh, gave them uh, translations of, of EU acquis on which we spend a lot of money and time, of course. Anna? Uh, I don't know whether the uh, listeners are aware, but there is a, such a thing as called EU presidency. Mm. Every six months, another country is at the helm. And, mm. we, and holding that, it actually makes you understand how the EU works even better, because you're actually part of all the real uh, decision-making process. We were uh, uh, honoured to, uh, to, to hold the presidency in the f mm. first half of uh, 2011. And one of our main aims was to finish the negotiation with uh, Croatia, which we, which we did. Uh, 
but also to further enlarge and to include Western Balkans mm. in the immediate enlargement because it's talking that stops warring. Yeah. And this is something that I think when we're talking about EU and all the institutions and all the basic values, where in this part of the world it might be important or interesting is that we have come through all these difficulties, even wars of less than a generation ago, and even wars that, that go back to many, many generations can be overcome. The compromises are sometimes painful, but mm. always less painful than fighting. I suppose to remind people, not so much in the room here today, because you will probably be familiar, but to the audience that's listening, we're talking about, when we talk about the Balkan Wars, the war in Slovenia in 1991, the Croatian War of Independence, the Bosnian War and the Kosovo War, including the NATO bombing. And David, these wars were, were shocking uh, for Europe at a time when we thought war had been put behind us in that part of the world. What did, what did the EU learn from these terrible times and what are the lessons that the EU has carried forward from them? Well, I think it is true to say that they, the, these wars were profoundly shocking to the member states of the European Union and to the Union as, as such, um, precisely because the prevention of war in Europe is, is at the core of, of the Union's uh, raison d'etre. During the wars, particularly in the early part of the 90s, um, we were unable to speak with one voice, one EU voice. There were different appreciations of the situation. There were different voices as to what should be done. And one, from that comes an important lesson that we needed to work much harder at assessing whether the gaps between us, between different national positions, whether those gaps were really so important that we saw the cost of not having Europe speak with one voice when we watched the siege of Sarajevo and so on. Mm. Are those gaps, were those gaps really so important that they were more important than what we were unable to do? The cost of what we call non-Europe, not being able to, to act as the European Union, was shown to us in a very, di very direct way in the area of foreign policy. And so from that came a renewed momentum for having a, a common foreign and security policy of the European Union, which got a major boost uh, for that reason. The second big boost came in relation to um, the question, well, if in the foreign policy world, Europe does speak with one voice and it does see the situation in the same way, what tools does it have in its toolbox mm. to be able to use? Mm. And there were major tools that a country normally has, which we did not have. Mm. Tools such as soldiers, mm. equipment, military, security, assets, we didn't have these as the European Union. Mm. But we learned the lesson that we need to do something more than what we already had. Mm. And from that came what we call the European Security and Defence uh, Policy in, in 99. And because of, from, from that background, uh, we are able to say today there are uh, EU ships patrolling the seas of Somalia in the uh, uh, fight against piracy. There have been European Union soldiers that have replaced NATO soldiers in Bosnia or in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. There are very real benefits that have come uh, to Europe and, I would suggest, modestly to the world from the fact that we got our act together much more strongly because we saw the cost of non-Europe from these tragic wars in the Balkans. If I could just make uh, a point in relation to your, the, 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 the previous uh, issue, the question of a countries, former enemies, working together in the European Union. Something that is not known or easily seen from the outside is that membership of the European Union is fundamentally a membership based on respect and equality among 
all of the member states. Mm. Yes, there are large member states and there are very small member states and there are big and medium sized, whatever you want. But because the enlargement process is a rigorous one, mm. everybody knows that when you look around the council table in Brussels, every single country that is there is there with exactly the same rights and on the same fundamental basis, they have their right at the table on the same basis as everybody else. Mm. There's nobody around that table who has any less of a right to be there. Mm. Now, this fundamental equality means that, uh, amongst other things, it means that in this part of a country's um, diplomatic and political life, it has a role to play in this European Union. And in playing that role in this European Union, it is there on an equal basis as everybody else. And this gives a tremendous boost to self-confidence, mm. but also to the sense of partnership. And this is what I would fully agree with, with Anna. She's given a great example of it just a minute ago, mm. when Hungary had to take over the chairmanship of the European Union. Mm. And it was as good a chairman as anybody else. And Poland has just uh, relinquished the chairmanship uh, earlier this year to, to Cyprus. So this is these countries acting on a, the same basis as everybody else, a tremendous equality between countries. And when, that, when you are looking at that between former enemies, it is a very powerful political force. Is this an unfinished story until the rest of the former Yugoslavian states join the EU? Is that, is that how we see this? Maybe, Vicenza, you could, you could talk to that. Uh, you, are, you, know, you are getting admission to the EU. Do you look forward to the day when the other former Yugoslavian parts of Yugoslavia join as well? Yes, for sure. Uh, I, I think uh, Serbia uh, got a uh, candidacy st status this year, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, in the next probably uh, next decade uh, we'll have uh, more member mm -hmm. states from that part of, of Europe. Mm. And as I said, uh, Croatia, after become, becoming uh, EU member state, we will more and more uh, have our neighboring uh, countries because. I think uh, it, it's uh, very important for the stability of this part of Europe. Yeah. Ruth, do you think the Balkan Wars rattled Europe at the time? D David's talked about the lessons that were learnt for the European Union, but it was, a, it, was a <coughs> it was a dreadful shock for Europe to realise that it could plunge into war again. Oh, yeah. to, to what extent did, did well, it rattle it? Well, I, I wasn't there at the time, mm. so, uh, but I know from you know, long distance Australia, yeah. I mean, I think it rattled the world. Rattled I mean, to world. see Europe, uh, um, you know, in such... Uh, and, of course, there was the issue of the NATO and the UN issue about empowerment. Um, but, yeah. yeah, I think it was... And, of course, Australia has large communities of our, um, our Balkan. Uh, so it was even from afar, sure. I suppose, Anna, the other thing is that the Balkan Wars were a reminder, of, I suppose, of how terribly the breakup of uh, communism could have panned out, but, but didn't. Well, exactly. I mean, this is uh, very important to remember that in 1988, 89, when all the changes happened, and Hungary and Poland were the first countries, but all the other countries sort of went after very quickly on the Berlin Wall, and, and if you remember, Ceausescu is Romania mm. falling in a few days. It was very no volatile, one expected, wasn't it? No one expected it to be that quick, to be that successful, and relatively so um, uh, bloodless. Mm. In fact, when... Uh, we have a day, June the 22nd, which we celebrate in Hungary, which was actually in 1991 mm. that the last uh, Soviet soldier left Hungary. Mm. So that was, well, a year and a half after the first elections. Mm. And so there was two, three years in that time when, uh, when we weren't quite sure what the future was. We were just hoping. And uh, with this hope, we, uh, we were also um, hoping that, uh, that all the possibilities and all the, um, all the opportunities that uh, joining the rest of Europe 
in a, in a organized fashion will actually create and enable us to, uh, to, to do a lot of trade, mm. to have a lot of dialogue. Mm. And as I said before, the freedom of actually being able to go to see each other, to talk to each other, to get to know each other, actually lessens tensions. One consequence of these wars was the creation of a common EU security and defence policy, David. How, how, how far has that developed? Well, it's, um, it's been growing. We've had it for more than 10 years now, so it's no longer absolutely new. But um, we have uh, had a number of very important military and security missions the ones I mentioned already in Bosnia and, and in, in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. But let's give a very, uh, another example. In, uh, in Africa, when the refugees were pouring over from Darfur into Chad, the world needed somebody to protect those refugees. Mm -hmm. And the European Union was the first off the blocks to be able to put, I think, three and a half thousand soldiers on the ground to protect those refugees um, as a holding operation while the UN processes were engaged uh, and uh, eventually, I think uh, 18 months or two years later, a UN force took over the protection of those refugees. I mean, this is a very clear example of the sort of capacity that we have given ourselves in Europe um, uh, to be able to react to these sorts of, you know, post-conflict um, situations, fragile situations. Uh, that force, if I remember correctly, I think it was, um, uh, there, were, there were soldiers from France, uh, Finland, uh, Ireland, and one other member state. Um, now, this is magical. Oh. Uh, don't forget that in the European Union, there are a number of countries that are militarily neutral, that are not part of NATO for example. Mm. So that Europe has been able to uh, give itself these sorts of tools is very important. In the peace uh, operations in Aceh, closer to home here in Australia, uh, in, in, in Aceh in Indonesia, Europe played a very important role. So we have been developing this security uh, arm. The European Union is not setting itself up in any way as a sort of a uh, an opposition to NATO or any sort of military superpower. But we are there able to bring uh, very precise uh, security aspects to difficult uh, issues around the world. Um, I would like also just Thanks, on... So, sorry, could I just yeah. mention that during the uh, Polish presidency of the EU, one of their priorities mm. was to actually strengthen yes. uh, the common, uh, the, the CF. CF CSDP. DP, yeah. Stronger coordination between yeah. the EU and NATO. Yeah. Does that impact on what you're saying? Well, it certainly does because we, we couldn't have been able to do this if we hadn't been able to work with NATO and avoid the complications that that could have resulted in. And Foreign Minister Sigorsky is, is one of those foreign ministers who's at the forefront Mm -hmm. of, of wanting us to do more and, and you know, this is part Does of the... Does the EU want to be one military power? Is that what it's moving toward? Well, I think uh, it, it's not moving towards being one military uh, superpower in, in, in that sort of sense, but being able to, to bring a, a civil and military aspect to difficult situations is important for us. We... Uh, we are able to bring what we call a comprehensive uh, approach to difficult issues. Comprehensive in the sense that today's European Union is able to have a security element. I take example again of anti-piracy in Somalia. We have a naval force there. Whoever thought 20 years ago, if you said the European Union would one day have a naval force, mm. people would have thought you were joking. Mm. But we have a naval force there that is operating in uh, cooperation with other navies. We have a humanitarian assistance program for Somalia, which is over 250 million euro. We have um, medium and long-term developmental assistance for the Horn of Africa, which is over 450 million euro, which is all about empowering those countries to build up their own capacities to solve these problems themselves so that 
uh, the international community can withdraw. This is what I mean by a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. And for a long, long time, we had many of these elements, but we didn't have the security element. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the hard edge, which, um, which you sometimes do need to implement uh, foreign policy. I'd like to come back to your question about uh, um, how do we see the other countries of the Western Balkans. Yes. Um, for these countries, Bosnia, Albania, uh, Montenegro, uh, former Yugoslav Republic, Macedonia, and so on. Back in, in 2001, uh, we uh, granted them a, a different political status from anybody else called potential candidate country. Croatia is an example of how a potential candidate country has become a candidate country for accession to the European Union a candidate country that has negotiated its succession, and next year it will join. The other countries it's of the region... economically in a much better position than a number of those other yes, Balkan states, though. But the, the, the economic aspect is, is not necessarily the most important, because it, it depends what you do with it. You need to build up your administration uh, so that you can implement the, the uh, key and so on. But the, the point I want to make is that the other countries are following. Um, we started accession negotiations in June this year with Montenegro. As Vincenya mentioned, we've given candidate country status this year to Serbia. Uh, we're working very closely with Bosnia and with Albania and with uh, Macedonia. Macedonia uh, also has a candidate country status and we want to move to negotiations as soon as that is possible. Mm. All of this to show that there is a political vision on the part of the European Union for the Western Balkans. Mm. I think, Anna, you wanted to say something? Yeah, it might be important to remember that uh, the enlargement uh, helped the countries that uh, joined the European Union with opportunities, but it also allowed the European Union new market uh, mm. opportunities. Enlargement meant that the whole of Europe is much much bigger both in the number of countries and the number of people. Mm. And furthering enlargement allows the EU to also grow in itself. The economic growth in the last eight years since 2004 when the 10 countries joined, 90% of the economic growth of the whole body of the EU came from those 10 countries. Yes. And that is something important. So it's a give and take uh, uh, relationship for all countries. Yeah. And I would just say that there's a lot of doubt about Europe, and in Australia especially, you, you hear a lot of criticism. And of course, the doubts, you know, there are a lot of, lot of as I said, it's a big family that we sometimes have a uh, disagreement. But I think it's not just in the Europeans' interest and our interest that the EU enlarge and, and succeed, but it's in the interest of the whole of the world, mm. given the centuries before. And, and Vicente, d does Croatia envisage uh, substantial economic benefits from becoming a member of, of the EU? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, now we will be <coughs> uh, um, part of a uh, of market of 500 million people and uh, uh, part of very big uh, uh, labour market and of course uh, uh, many opportunities for our young people to be better educated. But of course, uh, uh, Croatia as a, as a new member country, uh, um, we have, a, uh, we have a, a opportunity to, 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 to get a, a lot of money from, uh, from uh, uh, European funds, from mm. structural, structural funds and, and other, other funds. And I think uh, 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 it's, it's, it's a really big opportunity for us to improve our, our uh, economy and uh, our standard of living for our people. As is always the case with these discussions, it's raced through with uh, many questions uh, left still to be asked. I just wanted to quickly, before I do take some questions from the floor, just, just I mean, I suppose what's underlined tonight's discussion is the fact that the, e the EU is an attractive place for European countries to want to aspire to be. But it's not just new nations who are aspiring to be a part of the European Union, a huge number of migrants from non-European 
countries also want to come and live in the EU. The uh, countries of the EU are experiencing huge rates of immigration and illegal uh, immigration. And I just wanted to get a sense of, of how much of a problem that's perceived to be. Anna, I mean, we talk about this in Australia a, a, a quite a bit. We're talking about a very substantial problem. I know the Italians are rather exercised about this, but many European countries are, aren't they? Hungary is not, uh, uh, not one of the major countries where illegal immigration happens, although we do have to have our, our uh, borders uh, watched very, very carefully. There is such a thing as the Schengen Agreement, so if you can walk freely from one country to another in fif across 15 countries of, uh, of the EU. Italy is one of them. And uh, uh, last year there was an ASEM meeting uh, uh, in, uh, in Hungary where Australians were also taking place and uh, an interesting conversation happened just to give you a, a, an idea of the ratios is that uh, the 80 to 10,000 illegal immigrants that arrive in Australia uh, was mentioned as a, as, as a big problem and the Italian colleague said, well, is that every week? Because <laughs> that's what we have in Lampedusa. <laughs> That, that so to, to, to be much more serious about it, this is something that we are very aware of. Uh, Europe is very near uh, uh, problematic areas uh, Northern and Africa, uh, for example, areas yes. where there's a lot of pressure from people mm. to come in. And of course, we are very welcoming, but we do have to make sure that, uh, that we also protect the people who are already there. Mm. So over to you, David. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that this is, uh, this is a big issue. Um, and it propels us as the European Union to go further in developing a migration policy at the, at the European level. Um, but it is also a reminder as to why the European Union and its member states are providing almost 60% of all development assistance globally. Mm. It is because the fundamental solution to these sorts of problems lies not in the border arrangements that we have uh, on the EU exter external borders or not in how we do a burden sharing of, of, of asylum seekers or, or illegal immigrants and so on within Europe. The fundamental solution has to come from developing the source countries, making those countries themselves stronger. Oh. so that people are not leaving them, so that people see that they have a future in their own country. And that is a long-term project. Mm. But we are fully engaged in that. No, not, not all of uh, Europe is afraid of uh, migrants either. Uh, Ruth, you were saying that Russia, for example, uh, part of the broader region, uh, is wanting more immigrants. Uh, and, and, and Putin has, uh, is trying to encourage more people to come to well, Russia. Yes, I, uh uh, Putin just recently announced the first ever migration policy, 2025, that mm. Russia has ever had, and it's. I think they've uh, their Academy of Science has estimated that they have a shortage of one million per year in terms of um, job job needs um, and economic growth. So yes, um, perhaps. Mm. Uh, I don't know if the EU is engaging Russia on these sorts of issues. But one of the, the key uh, co contributors to this is brain drain. And there's a, a continuing young, educated Russians moving into Europe. Now, Vincente, one final question that I need clarification on. As I was preparing for tonight's program and doing some research on Croatia, I stumbled across the fact that Croatia invented the necktie <laughs> were, you, were you aware of this? Uh, uh, we, we, we know that, yes. Uh, a unifying symbol? We, we, we uh, call it uh, Croata. Croata? Croata, yes. That, that's, that's, uh, uh, that means. But uh, uh, if I can say a few, few words uh, about uh, something very uh, positive that is happening on, in the relation between Australia and, and Croatia. Mm. Uh, um, Every year, nearly to 100,000 Australians visit in Croatia. And, um, for example, at the, at the end of the 90s, that number was uh, less than 10,000. That means today that number is 10 times more. Mm -hmm. And that also, uh, I think, uh, are showing that uh, uh, people from this part of the world uh, understanding more and more, more what Croatia is. 
and uh, tomorrow when Croatia will become a, a member state in EU, I think uh, the relations between uh, our two countries will be improved. In Croatia is well and truly on the backpacker yeah. map. Uh, yes, uh, for sure. Essential but not, not just visit. for them, because uh, yes, many, many, many people love to, to come to Croatia and uh, sail amongst uh, uh, 1,300 old Croatian islands and uh, tasting our food and wines. And, um, they are welcome to Croatia. We've had a whole conversation without even talking about Australian and Croatian football matches and there's been some uh, classic conflicts between those two countries over the years in the World Cup but uh, I think we'll leave that for another time, perhaps yeah. when the drinks are being served later because I do have to take some questions from uh, the floor and some quick hands have uh, come up. So the gentleman in the front here and then the lady behind. We're going to get a microphone onto you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we have heard a lot about the European Union, and it was a bit of an inside conversation, but I was wondering how the European Union member countries react to the statement made by the Australian Prime Minister recently, I thought it was in New York, that the shift of world power and importance is going towards Asia. So I would like to know whether whether Australia still has a strategic interest in Europe in the future and whether the European Union member countries still believe that uh, this shift of emphasis to Asia is very relevant or will diminish, diminish the importance of the European Union. Thank you. Who Can wants just, to have a go at that one? Just quickly and then I'll pass it on. But uh, an indicator is that we're wanting to... Uh, promote our relationship with the EU to treaty level and we're working on this happening hopefully mm. very soon um, and that indicates that we see do you know the EU can buy, the EU is our largest investor mm. uh, it is our second largest trading partner so you know mm. after China so the Euro and, and uh, um, Minister Carr in a speech a couple of months ago said that, you know, our relationship with Europe is just as crucial as any other, um, mm. as our relationship with Asia. And our mutual interest in Asia is another sort of driving force for our relationship with the EU. It's not the first time this question has come up in these series of discussions, but it's an important question nonetheless. <laughs> Well, I would say that, um, firstly, I would, I would say that Vincenya has already given the essence of, of the answer as far as the European Union is concerned. And it is, it is this, that um, the European Union uh, is very aware of uh, a, the, the impact of the emerging countries and the, the new economic dynamism in Asia. And the question for us is, well, how do we see ourselves reacting to that? Do we see ourselves reacting to that simply as a strong individual country, as Germany or Ireland or Portugal or Finland or whoever? Or do we see ourselves reacting to that as a strong country, part of a strong Europe? Mm. And that is the answer. Mm. Because all member states, and you can read the speeches of prime ministers and foreign ministers across Europe without exception, all member states of the European Union see themselves facing this uh, Asia-Pacific century, as it has been called, as part of a strong Europe. Mm. Yeah. Can we get a microphone? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Excellencies. I'll start my questions in order, if I may, <laughs> from the left to the right. You have right. a series of questions, oh, no, no. do you? Uh, quick ones. So my name is Ina Markovic. I'm from the uh, PhD school here. Okay. Um, my first question for the Hungarian ambassador. Um, in, the, in the Australian media, we had quite a few reports when um, Slovakia and Hungary recently had an issue, and apparently that was the first time a Schengen was suspended for one day by Slovakia um, regarding um, the visit by the Hungarian uh, leader there. Um, could you please update us on this issue, if you, if you may? And um, um, we're hopeful that some positive steps have been undertaken to advance the positive relationship between these two countries. Um, Ambassador Daly, there's so many questions I have, but um, one of them is, um, in recent days, we heard a general from Spain commenting that Spain is not a Yugoslavia. Um, 
in case um, that a, region, a Spanish region of Catalonia uh, proclaims independence over the coming months in November more precisely, um, what would the European Union do? What role does it have now? And does, uh, is the Com European Commission taking any steps to address this issue? Um, maybe, maybe we'll keep it at two. Okay, we'll sure. keep it at two. Yeah. Because <laughs> that, that second question on Spain, we could be here all night answering. But yeah. Anna, I'll, I'll let you answer the first question and then you're on the hot seat afterwards, David. As I was saying that uh, the European Union is one big family with a lot of thing, on a lot of things, a lot of basic issues, you agree in the family and sometimes you have uh, squabbles with various parts. But the EU is there to unite us and to have a look at what unites us rather than what divides us. Obviously, there's lots of historical questions that could divide us and, uh, and that is not what we want to concentrate on. This particular issue happened actually three years ago. There was an official visit or a private visit where, uh, where the Hungarian president didn't, couldn't get into Slovakia, but I think he was the only one in the last few years who was not allowed in, so we, I don't think that's, uh, uh, that is of a major importance. What is, though, and this, you know, is the, is the uh, larger sort of context of your question, is that there are various uh, people in Europe living in various countries, you know, whether they be German speakers in Italy or Basques in, in Spain or Northern Irish in, in Britain or Hungarians in various other countries around us. And the main thing is we're all European. And the EU means that we can actually be united and be together in the same family without having to uh, determine who comes from exactly where. So that's how we see it. So those bridges are basically open. I think one of the best symbols that Hungary and Slovakia uh, is, uh, is having a much better relationship than before is that we reopened some of the bridges that were blown up in the Second World War and were blown up for 50 years. Mm. Obviously, who speaks what language and what exact rights they have, these are issues that we have to solve, and we are talking about them and... and, and having conversations. That's what Europe is about. Very diplomatic. <laughs> David. Well, I think Anna has also given me uh, part of, of my answer because um, one of the things that the European Union is about is precisely uh, making borders between the European countries more and more irrelevant. Um, we have a Europe today where uh, as citizens of member states of the European Union, you have rights whether you live in your own country or in another member state. Um, uh, people and goods and capital move freely across uh, the borders without hindrance. So part of the, the answer is the reflection that uh, Europe is much more about making borders irrelevant uh, than uh, the creation of, of new uh, internal borders. Second point I would make is that um, an issue such as the one that, that, that you uh, put is firstly um, an issue for, for Spain and for Catalonia uh, and, and so on, um, or for any region of any member state. Uh, it, is, it is firstly an issue for them uh, to, to, to sort out. Um, the European Union is very, very good at being able to manage and live with very complicated situations. But we're also very, very good at not predicting in advance exactly what those complicated <laughs> arrangements uh, would ever be. Um, and we're very bad we're very bad at answering hypothetical questions. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the issue of Spain, though, rather compounded by the economic problems it now finds itself in? Well, I don't know enough myself of the, mm -hmm. of the Spanish situation. A very good question for the Spanish ambassador. <laughs> um, yes. OK, I just thought I'd throw that one in. Um, we'll, no. Yeah, my name is Edgar Thielmann. I'm uh, from the European Commission, seconded to the Centre for European Studies. <coughs> Indeed, I think it came out of the statements and the discussion, the European Union is an interesting place to be. Mm -hmm. And I think we should remember that in order to become a member of the European Union, the first step is to ask to become a member. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think that was not really coming out of the discussion. We were speaking about what will happen if you are a member and so on. And to just give you a very simple example how attractive the European Union is, if you look at the Olympic Games in London, not a long time ago, a beautiful games, if you took a look into the gold medals gained by China and by the US, if you put both together, you have about the number of gold medals won by the European Union athletics. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows a little bit in a simple way. My real question is European integration and crisis. David gave an example uh, with the Balkans, how the European Union was getting improving the instruments, how to get better. And now my question, Euro crisis, economic crisis, what are the lessons from there? Will it lead to more integration or to less integration? Mm. Well, there's another theme that we've been coming back to in these discussions too. Um, it's a long answer and a short answer mm -hmm. to that one. I think the short, the the, short answer is the, the, the one. The short answer to that question is yes. The, <laughs> the, uh, That's yes to more Europe. Yes to more Europe. I mean, the crisis uh, has demonstrated that we need to do more things together. We need to, do, we need to go more deeply in our, in our integration, especially in the euro area. It has shown that we have... Uh, the common currency, yes, we have the, the, the monetary policy, yes, but we have not got um, other elements of an economic and monetary union to the same level as we have the common currency. So we, we have already started going much more deeply on economic uh, uh, cooperation, on how we uh, coordinate economic policy within the euro area. Um, Every time uh, there is a, a meeting of the European leaders, there are new steps going forward. Um, the latest uh, thing was in June where there was political agreement given to uh, a single uh, banking supervisory mechanism for all banks in the euro area. Uh, and the technical proposals were, were put by the Commission to the Council earlier this month. Europe today is alive with uh, new measures and new ideas about how to go further. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is no discussion about, oh, should we go more deeply or not? That's past. The discussion is all about how do we move forward and how to navigate that because it is complicated. But uh, that's, that's the, still the short answer to the question. There's so much more that can be said. Indeed. Could I mention, sorry? Yes. Uh, yes. Just recently, some foreign ministers, 11 foreign ministers, were in Warsaw. Mm, yes. And they came out, the future of Europe, and it was right across every, every issue. It was, you know, integration, uh, you know, working together uh, much more, and, and rules-based, perhaps, more rules-based. Yeah, and President Van Rompuy will propose... Uh, he would continue a debate on, on what he calls a, a genuine economic and monetary union, which is about a banking union, about fiscal union, about economic union, and about a deeper political underpinning of all of this, so that there is proper legitimacy and accountability for it. So it is a very exciting time, I think, in terms of European integration. I have to wrap it. It's been terrific talking to you all. Thank you very much. Will you please thank all of our ambassadors and former uh, ambassadors. <laughs>